because it is my utmost pleasure. Come on, all closer to welcome Daniel here. Because Daniel is the founder of Block and Wine and from Anon and Mike is here as well. So it's very gorgeous that you're both here and that you are representing today Dokapi. And we will not only talk about Dokapi, but we'll also talk about NFTs, right? Um, this is a purpose some of us are, uh, well, following since some time ago. So cool to have you here. Now some block. Let's have some wine later on. Perfect. Um, usually we always ask at the beginning of block and wine, who doesn't speak German? Okay, perfect. No, sometimes we just only had one person, but we, al we always talk in English if someone doesn't speak German. So perfectly fine. Um, yeah, today I'm presenting um, our new startup. Or it's not as new anymore. We already uh, work on it for almost or for more than a year. So as you can see, the easiest way to buy and sell NFTs. I know we are in the bear market, or you know, opinions uh, are not completely aligned here, but let's say we're in a bear market. But still, um, yeah, I want to show you a little bit about what we think is the main problem that uh, is uh, basically constraining the growth of the NFT market space. Um, as you know, most platforms like OpenSea or LooksRare or Maker's Place or Non Origin, the let's say most famous NFT marketplaces are all Web3 marketplaces, decentralized marketplaces. So you need quite deep technical knowledge. You need um, to pay in cryptocurrencies. The whole user journey is pretty cumbersome. You need to manage your own private key. You're exposed to um, volatile volatility, not only network usage of Ethereum but also in price movements of Ethereum. And I'm not sure how experienced everybody here is, but in the world of multi-chain and layer two solutions, you have to bridge from one chain to another. Uh, multi-chain can be quite complicated. Um, so we thought the easiest solution is a custodial marketplace. Uh, since everybody starts his crypto journey on, on a custodial marketplace, Binance, Kraken, Coinbase, maybe a lot here in Austria on Bitpanda, and we cannot expect people in the NFT space to jump from Web 2 directly into Web 3. So uh, a custodial platform is a solution uh, that has been working for crypto and will also work and is also needed for, for NFTs. So um, does everybody know the difference between custodial and non-custodial? I know that you know it, but or maybe easier, who doesn't know it? Like just, okay, perfect. So um, custodial means that you don't have to have a wallet. Um, we manage everything for you. You just sign up with username, email, password, and all the blockchain space, blockchain stuff is managed for you. So you have a normal user journey that you know from eBay or Amazon and the disadvantages that the coins from you actually we own it but we manage a database and you have to trust us that we keep it safe and we do not go bankrupt and everything but you know it's always a trade-off between usability and security so all platforms like Binance, Kraken, Coinbase they're all custodial all, or Bitpanda and non-custodial is basically the true web3 spirit um, like if you compare it to exchanges, you have Uniswap or SushiSwap. Uh, if you look at NFT marketplaces, you have OpenSea or LuxRare, where you basically just connect your Web3 wallet, MetaMask or Trust Wallet, and y you are basically just a public address. You could be anyone. You're anonymous. You have to use cryptocurrencies. You have to manage your own security. It's like the, the true spirit of crypto, but it's not for everybody and definitely not for beginners. So most or every beginner starts on a custodial platform. And this is the main difference. So Web 2, Web 3, custodial, non-custodial, decentralized versus centralized. And yeah, why we are doing it, I basically explained it already. Um, it's just super easy. And we can also offer fiat payments, traditional payment methods, 
buy NFTs with Sofort Supervisor. You can use George, N26, whatever you want, credit, debit card. It's pretty simple. So that's why we say easiest way to buy and sell NFTs. Everybody can do it. And yeah, um, our USPs, basically I explained them already. Um, custodial, um, regulated and safe, so you're buying on a platform that is operated by a Portuguese LDA, same as a GmbH, GmbH here in Austria. Pretty easy, you know whom you're interacting with. And the cool thing is we also have multi-chain support right from the start, so you can buy and sell NFTs on Polygon and Ethereum. Maybe some ask why do you have two chains? Ethereum is mainly used for like um, blue chip NFTs or valuable collections like art and most gaming use cases do not work on Ethereum because it's simply too expensive. So we offer Polygon as an alternative for gaming, for several other use cases because NFTs is not only art, it can be everything. So that's why we thought it's very important to have multi-chain support right from the start to offer brands um, the alternative. Also, for example, imagine you're a football club and you want to sell digital jerseys. Just, I think yesterday or two days ago, Adidas announced a digital jersey with a chromey squiggle here. Most likely nobody knows what it is, but if you're, deep, if you're in the NFT space, you, you could know it. And um, for example, if you want to sell the digital jersey to a football fan, you will not be able to ask like two, three, four hundred euros, which most uh, Ethereum NFTs are currently priced at. And if you do it on Polygon, minting is free almost, smart contract deployment is free almost. So you can basically uh, sell NFTs that are priced between 10, 15, 20 euros and make it really accessible to the masses. Um, yeah, our roadmap, actually I do not really want to do it to copy pitch. So um, our roadmap is just to make it always as easy as possible and improve usability for the user. Um, this is our team. Um, it's from the old pitch deck, so we have a new CTO now. But yeah, it's me, Dominic. He's also a, a true block and whiner. We have Michael here. We have Chris here, um, co-founder, uh, CMO, head of business development reach out to them, they're both NFT DGENs, they can talk with you about everything NFT basically. And yeah, I mean, I actually would love to talk a little bit about NFTs in general. So I don't know, normally in Block and Wine we always did like Q&A sessions and everything. So I wouldn't, con I don't like to call myself an NFT expert, but you could say I am one <laughs> since I'm not doing anything since three years. So. If you have any questions about like maybe to copy or NFTs in general, um, I don't know from time, how much time do we have? I don't know. So if you want, just ask anything from a beginner's level to expert level to intermediate to don't ask me what you should buy, but everything else is fine. I don't know. If there are no questions, it's fine as well. So don't feel pressured. Oh, Lucas. Hey Daniel, I wanted to ask this before, but I think there's there maybe a funny story behind that. Why do you call yourselves non-fungible partners? Because we're an NFT company, and obviously we are non-fungible partners. I mean, the co-founder. You can't exchange. You can fire the developer or whatever, but your co-founders are non-fungible. You cannot trade them. So we thought it's cool to call ourselves non-fungible partners. Nobody can replace you. Nobody can replace every founder, not just me. <laughs> there are three non-fungible partners. Yeah. And I up before I forget, um, because then Michael pro most probably will kill me if I don't mention it. Um, we have a drop today at 8 p.m. It's in... 30 minutes, 34 minutes. Um, if everything works, um, German word, for a few effect could happen, you know, always the same. But um, it's an open edition for one euro. So it's, um, I would say, quite accessible. <laughs> 
it's open for 10 minutes. So, okay, maybe some people don't know what an open edition is. Um, the difference between open and limited edition is an open edition is NFTs on demand. So we have an edition that is open for 10 minutes and we can buy five NFTs or 5,000. It doesn't matter. It's like all you can NFT within 10 minutes. And once the sale is closed, we know the final number and then we start the minting process. It's quite a famous sale type in NFT space because two years ago everything was bought, um, dominated and all 10 uh, limited editions of 10, 15, sometimes 100 were sniped by bots in five seconds and you had no chance to buy anything. So people came up with open editions which made NFTs accessible to everybody in the first place. And yeah, so you can sign up on your mobile phone, you can buy it if you like it, um, credit card, debit card, sofort Überweisung, it's actually quite simple. And yeah, that's the drop for tonight. I would love to show it now, but I don't know if that works. It's quite funny. It's like a clap, clapping animation. <laughs> it's, it's by an Austrian artist, support the local art scene. Yeah, so I don't know if you have any questions. Oh, so Tertilt. I know everybody, it's so nice. Um, okay, you are my specialist for NFTs, yeah? You and sure. Michael, uh, for sure. And uh, could you give us perhaps a, a short uh, overview about the current situation in NFTs, about the turnovers, about a little bit about the prices to get a, get a feeling about the situation there? Um, there's one big thing that we have to discuss in the first place. Do you look at dollar values or do you look at Ethereum? Then everything is down pretty bad. <laughs> but like, so back in 2017, everybody, or everybody, sorry, <laughs> not everybody, but most people bought altcoins to get more Bitcoin. That was like the, the game plan. And now in the last two years, it was like, obviously not for everybody, but by NFTs, the goal is to get more Ethereum. So at least for me, if I buy an NFT for one Ethereum, I want two Ethereum. And I don't care if it's more dollar or not in the end, but obviously from a dollar value, NFTs are down heavily. Like Bored Apes, I think the top was what, 500k almost, now it's at 80 or, or 90k, so um, yeah, and most projects are almost at zero. Um, yeah, the NFT space maybe, or not maybe, it developed in a kind of strange direction with PFP projects, like the entry barrier to launch an NFT collection is almost non-existent. You can hire someone on Fiverr to create you 10,000 randomly generated images. Um, you can even you can basically get everything on Fiverr. The only thing you have to do is marketing. So it was pretty easy to launch unlimited number of random NFTs, mainly PFPs. From I think every animal has at least 10 NFT collections. Every big collection has at least 100 derivatives, like punks looking to the right. Then you have punks looking to the left, upside down punks. Like you have, people came up with every random shit possible. So it was like really creative freedom, bullshit bingo. And obviously most of this is not valuable anymore, but there are some NFT brands like Doodles. The, I think the CEO of Billboard left Billboard to become CEO of Doodles. Um, brand ambassador of Doodles is now Pharrell Williams. You had at Ape Fest in New York, you had Eminem and Snoop Dogg and Lil Wayne performing. Like some of these brands are, like, they're most likely becoming huge brands in the in the real world as well. And the problem, all, then the, the other problem is all those collections are super expensive. 
So if you want to doodle, you have to pay 12k. If you want to buy an ape, you have to buy 90k, uh, pay 90k. It's like it's not. It's hard now to buy NFTs for from an investment perspective. If you like art, if you like digital art, there's countless of opportunities. You can support small, medium, big artists from everywhere around the world. That's quite cool. Um, gaming is also interesting. Um, I, I personally think gaming is the most interesting use case because gamers are digital natives and digital ownership in the virtual world is the best use case in my opinion. So I'm trying to, my, my personal goal right now is to try to find some games that might be good in the future and buy those NFTs because they are still quite cheap. But in general, yeah, the market is down bad. Most people now say it's all trash. But for me, this is like part of the normal crypto life. I, I'm completely relaxed. Um, for me, it's like, yeah, um, for me, it's more like, what do I buy now? But the problem is everything I want is extremely <laughs> expensive. But uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, uh, the thing is those, the things I want will also not drop because so many people are waiting for them to go to like accessible levels which will not happen, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, NFTs, I'm more bullish on NFTs than on crypto for two simple reasons. Nobody will, like, okay, you told me today that some people want to make it a security, which is absolute garbage, but that's just my opinion. But in theory, like NFTs don't want to tech, like they don't want to remove banks. They do not try to re completely remove the middleman. They do not threaten the financial system. So there is no real reason to try to push them down through regulation. This is one big advantage of NFTs. And the other one is it's super easy, understandable. Like crypto is an investment. A lot of why are no, almost nobody is invested in stocks because the, the the story is stocks are for rich people, it's super complicated, you have to be careful, it doesn't work, it's like, and f this crypto is quite, it's not as extreme but similar, you know, it's, it's still an investment, considered an investment and NFTs is, it's a collectible, it can be an, a, com a ticket to an event, it can be art, it can be whatever, and these are, these two things make me more bullish on crypto, it will not, uh, on NFTs. It will not be he heavily regulated, plus it's a mass product. And crypto is definitely not a mass product yet, and maybe it will never be, who knows. So, yeah, quite a long answer, Ernst. Sorry for that. Uh, Daniel, uh, what, what value do you look for for yourself and for the company in this space? Come again? What value do you look for for yourself and for the company in this space? I basically, I'm the NFT guy in my family and within all my friends and I tried to get some into NFTs and I lost, like everybody got lost on the way because it's too complicated. So our, the value we seek is to, to basically onboard everybody that is waiting on the sidelines to the space. And the other thing is at the moment, all brands, I always say, let's say this is the Ethereum community and their liquidity. And all brands come and basically just drink liquidity from us Ethereum people from the NFT community and they don't really give anything back. They just come and sip the juice and make money and they don't bring their own community, which is not very healthy for the space, obviously. So through a platform like Tokapi, we also want to offer brands a possibility to sell NFTs to their community. Because if you go to, I don't know, let's, let's say an influencer wants to do NFTs, he posts Instagram story, yes, no, how many people have a Web3 wallet? Most likely 1% or maybe, I don't know, is anybody an influencer here? We, we could try it, but I, I guess not more than 5% will say they have a Web3 wallet. So that's the, that's the issue. And we want to offer, like, as I said, brands, football clubs, everybody, the opportunity to also onboard their community through a platform like Tokapi. And the, in the next stage, obviously, comes education, where we tell the people maybe through 
uh, I don't know, gamification or learn to earn, whatever we come up with, um, a way to, to slowly transition them into the Web3 space. But yeah, right now it's just sipping Ethereum liquidity and most people not, um, you know, ready to take all the extra miles to join the space. So these are, I would say, the two main personal and in general company motivations. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. I would have two questions. So first one is an easy one. Tokapi reminds me of that palace in Turkey, Topkapi. Can you explain how you came up with the name maybe? First question. And secondly, um, what are your main competitors as non-custodial um, NFT marketplaces and why are you better than these? Sure, um, so you're actually the first person to talk about the palace in Turkey, it's true, but there's also an animal called Okapi, it's the forest giraffe and one of our initial co-founders was a German guy that we met here in Vienna at the meetup and he had the initial idea for Tokapi and he was completely hyped on this name. He always sees something in everything and he, <laughs> he is a funny guy. It would be cool if he would be here. Uh, and he said, you know, you have the word OK, you have API, you have the number P, you have token, you have Okapi. He says everybody sees what he wants to see. And we thought, you know, it reminds me a little bit of um, Togepi. There's also, I think it's a Pokemon. And like everybody sees anything in the name. Uh, and that's why we chose it. Because everybody in the, he, he proposed the name and everybody had his own imagination of, of the word right away. And we thought it's it's maybe, I mean, it's always also if you're founders, then you think about the name. In the end, it's either you choose something that immediately tells you what it is, or you choose something random and try to make it re re memorable. Like, how do you say? Re rememberable? Is this a word? Recognizable Something. or rememberable? Is this, is this a... Hmm? Memorable. And is rememberable also a word? Could be. Rememberable. <laughs> And the second question is competitors. Um, the good thing is everybody wants to be the next OpenSea. Nobody wants to be the next Nifty Gateway. And Nifty Gateway is our biggest competitor by far. They are, I don't know if anybody knows it, but always when people ask me how do I buy NFTs, I unfortunately had to tell them on Nifty Gateway because they are or were the first platform that allowed you to buy NFTs with credit card. They are a custodial platform owned by the Winklevoss brothers, so by Gemini. It's quite funny. The Nifty Gateway is founded by twins and they got bought by twins. So, yeah, fun fact. Um, and they are by far our biggest competitor. And you could also argue that Binance is a competitor and uh, Crypto.com, but they do not really offer you fiat payments like they always offer you buy crypto with fiat and good for us is that they mainly try to push their own blockchains so crypto.com is mainly pushing nfts on crypto.com chain which nobody cares about um, and binance is mainly pushing binance smart chain but yeah obviously um, they are competitors as well in some sort and what are we doing better um, we always have this like European card. Not sure if this is an advantage today, most likely. <laughs> like from an operational perspective, it's definitely a disadvantage to be a European company. So if you're planning to do a crypto startup, don't do it in the European Union. It's really, yeah, not so funny. <laughs> uh, and, but our main advantage is we are multi-chain right from the start. We are built by NFT natives, so I have 1,000 something NFTs. Chris, I will not disclose it, but he has some NFTs as well. Um, you can ask him in private if you want, but like combined our team and everything, I think we have like 10,000 NFTs. We haven't done anything else in the last three years, which is good for the company, maybe not so good for the private life, uh, but um, yeah, it's like, 
uh, the main advantage is basically that like sometimes you have an advantage if you're still a small company um, and then we have a very dedicated team that is are only NFT natives. The multi-chain aspect and actually, I hope, I don't know, maybe you guys know it, I don't think there is any NFT marketplace where you can currently buy with Sofort Überweisung, which is quite cool. And um, yeah, those are the main advantages. We would also like to offer PayPal, but it doesn't really work, unfortunately. Not yet. Like at the moment, it's more curated because we don't want to be like OpenSea where it's spammed with a lot of, you know, not so nice NFTs. Um, but in the future, the, like right now, we you apply as a creator and we create a drop with you together. But in the future, we want to um, have a system where creators apply, we, we basically accept them. So this will always be the case. We will never open the platform for like everybody, most likely. Um, and then once you're a whitelisted creator, we'll have access to, we call it Mint Dashboard. It allows you to create um, an NFT drop like an Instagram post. You basically choose image, name, description, it's super easy. And then you will have your, your own profile with a like drop section that you, so you have your own little sales page. It's maybe a little bit Shopify style. And this will be on the roadmap for later this year. But now it's like really just direct partnership with us. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Give a good applause to Daniel. Thank you. Now go and get some liquidity out of your community. <laughs> No, and um, from now on, it's my pleasure that um, we have now Flood on stage. Um, something in life happens which is not initially a good thing, but what is definitely a good thing is that now you have become a, such a vibrant member of the blockchain community in Vienna as a whole. So cool to have you here and give Flood a big applause. Thanks a lot. Yeah, always live presentations are hard, so I will actually uh, try to minimize my live involvement today, uh, but let's get started. So, as you have already noticed, there is some play of words with how Nier is Web4. If you've heard about Nier, uh, it, I will cover all that part in my presentation, but uh, actually what I want to start with is, okay, actually, and here is a blow, um, yeah, so not blockchain, so let's let's actually not try to be tied to some stigmas and some uh, uh, previous knowledge about uh, what we know about the space. And today I want to actually uh, ruin a lot of myths for you guys about wh like what, what decentralization and what, what this whole space could be about. Uh, so, first of all, NIR is a solution, it's not just another blockchain, not another coin, and uh, the, it was a great question uh, about like naming, and I, I think it's a good start, starting point where I can uh, introduce NIR. Uh, initially, it was a startup in California, which uh, um, friends of mine actually founded, and, and uh, they wanted to uh, to teach, to teach computers how to code, and there is an idea of uh, a, in a science fiction book called uh, Singularity is Near, and that's the name actually uh, where Near came from. So the idea is when you build some uh, some system which can improve itself, even by a slight little bit, and you just allow it to reiterate again and again. And quite fast enough you will reach the point where uh, we don't understand how this uh, system works, let alone like whether we actually control it. Uh, but what we realize on the way there is there are some low hanging fruits uh, in, the, uh, 
in the world that needs to be addressed because we actually we tried to collect the data for that uh, startup and realized it's very hard to engage with many um, uh, people out there um, and allow them to be fairly paid and uh, play fair, fair rules. So imagine you would have a platform where you would sign up uh, and um, do some tasks, some small tasks to uh, collect the data for machine learning. Um, and you want to be paid across the globe and you don't know who your employer is. Um, when we initially tried to build it with the Web2 technologies, we faced the problem of like, well, there is some uh, problem of paying abroad, there are some uh, operational costs to that, and we decided to look into the space of blockchain and try it with Ethereum. And realized, well, uh, Ethereum is uh, even more expensive and even more limiting to us. And this is where like, Nier actually uh, appeared on the stage. So there was a problem that we wanted to solve. And uh, the properties of that problem is that we actually want to have the internet with trusted shared state, universal API, and no central authority because we cannot have one uh, that we can agree upon. Um, just to unpack this whole statement, uh, let's start with uh, first statement. So trusted shared state, what do I mean about that actually? Um, this is an F NFT and I will come later about like what NFT is actually. Um, this is one of the platforms, one of the views, one of the uh, projects out there who can provide you with a nice looking UI uh, showing you more details about this particular NFT. But then, boom, you go to another website, you have the same NFT, you have again same owner uh, here, so it's, uh, it just picks up from the same source, from the blockchain, and it's agreed upon, and we, we have the same version for nerds in, uh, in the block explorer, you can see all the like, uh, uh, details over there, that this uh, NFT was minted, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so ultimately, the uh, trusted shared state was about that it's universal, you have it everywhere, and you can just rely on, on this state. And also, not only like it's the same state everywhere, it, you can change it uh, in, in, a, in this, um, uh, across the globe without a single place. Uh, if we're talking about uh, universal API, uh, just briefly mentioning that the same uh, same NFT, you can query it from CLI, for example, from various other tools. Um, this is just one way of it. So we will just uh, call a method called NFT token and provide some parameters. So we want to see the token ID, uh, this one. And boom, the, the answer would be the title of this NFT is this one. Uh, there is a media file link attached to it is a PFS link. Uh, so a uh, bunch of um, metadata that you can later use and reuse in various projects out there. And no central authority is a, a last piece, core piece for, for this to work. Uh, as already mentioned, it's very hard when you um, cannot really make any changes. So we, we could say, well, we have internet and we can just back up everything all the time. But it, that would be solving only one part of it. You, you will have the data, but you have no way to actually change it. Uh, so this is an example of Web4, where I actually uh, took the Block and Wine web page and deployed to the blockchain. So it's currently living in the blockchain uh, as a like code which returns you an HTML uh, in return. And we have a bunch of those um, gateways. Uh, and when you go to blockandwine.testnet.page, you will get this one. Also, if you would go, just an example, potentially somebody launching another gateway, you would go to blockandwine.testnet.google.com, you will see the same website. 
So this actually uh, is an extension to the uh, blockchain space which we previously were uh, maybe using, maybe not, uh, some of us for sure. Uh, but finally we bridged the gap uh, with the regular web usage. So it's my, uh, uh, my web browser in, in a, um, on my smart, smartphone capable to open this website from the blockchain without extra extensions or anything. Uh, you can find the source code over there and this is a link to, to this page if you want to just try it out. Uh, another interesting part is this a Sweatcoin project. Uh, I'm not sure whether you've heard about it, but it's number one app overall in the, on uh, Apple Store uh, now. And it's, it recently la got launched with Nier as a partnership. And it's a interesting uh, study case, I would say, because they actually launched as a centralized platform initially. Uh, they didn't have um, blockchain in mind at all. They, they wanted to, um, to reward their users who just walk on the streets uh, and uh, collect their like sweat <laughs> by, by walking. Uh, and uh, engage with the, some partnerships uh, and sell goods. Uh, so it's advertisement marketplace, I would say. Uh, but it was quite successful and uh, their users actually demanded to use to like some blockchain to, to power their um, uh, tokens and uh, rewards. So they uh, tried to, to go with Ethereum and all, the, all other side chains, but realized it's, it's just super slow and impossible to scale. And uh, so it was April 12th uh, this year, and now they have five million new users since that time, uh, all on board it on year as well. Uh, so this is uh, something to, to to tell you about the scale and the performance of the of the whole platform. Uh, yeah. So this is another example of the uh, Web4 web app. Or that leaves under lens.near.page. Uh, it's, it's a web browser game where you can actually try it out and uh, buy some proper virtual property. So it was just a demo basically type of app, but it's also quite successful because it's uh, interactive. You cannot build it on like classic um, proof of work platforms because that would take enormous amount of time to uh, to send the blocks, uh, or to, I mean to, to produce the block, and that is that means that in order to update the information in the in the chain, it would take you so much time. With near, I just want to uh, remind you that basically the uh, time that you uh, from from you to su you submitting some transaction, some change, you, you request some change to be uh, recorded on this decentralized platform that is running across the globe 24-7, uh, it takes you just one second to, to get the change recorded in the network and three, three more seconds to just make sure that it's not going to be reverted. So if something happens in between uh, one and the first second and the third second, that could potentially lead to uh, your change being reverted, but after three seconds, the, the transaction is applied and tokens are transferred or function is called whatever. So this whole uh, scope of tooling and, uh, and vision is what allows actually to, to build such applications and uh, um, and explore the world because we actually started not, not with the like another blockchain type of problem, but actually wanted to have a solution uh, that is fast, scalable, and all that. Um, getting back to the to fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, which like non-fungible is NFT, I just want to emphasize that it's actually just one small um, convention that is defined in, in words, yes, among the developers, but it's actually a very small idea and a small like application uh, for the blockchain space. It's definitely nice to have all those various v 
visual um, representations and projects that build upon near uh, uh, NFT. Mm, but overall, I wouldn't. I, I would say like it's it's a bit overrated, but at the same time, it's a good demo. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that we are yet to see more and more. Um, conventions and applications that would interact with each other and we shouldn't limit ourselves to just NFT, NFT here. Uh, so one of the examples that was actually initially proposed in Ethereum world but never uh, spun up because of the uh, costs and also the uh, lim limitations of the platform I would say uh, is uh, the idea of having DAO, decentralized autonomous organizations. So you basically ha can have some uh, place where you can uh, manage um, communities like this one, like Block and Wine, and actually um, have a, a, a tool for you. So there is a tool already for you uh, to, to try it out. And today, we, uh, I actually have this link over there. We can try it out, or, uh, everybody, everybody here. Uh, there is a bounty, so you can, you can launch various type of uh, in, like, uh, organization or community type of um, voting or like um, proposals. So you, you, you basically the, the, the whole idea of uh, DAOs is to submit a proposal and uh, somehow and vote for it with the community of, of your organization. So there are different types of proposals to send funds, to, uh, to add new members, to buy and sell NFTs, to, uh, to have some bounties, so other like external people could actually participate, and polls if you want to vote for some uh, decision, for example. Uh, and uh, here today, I'd like us to, uh, to try to uh, conduct this bounty. Uh, so we are going to have the pizza over here. And we, when you will have the bounty done, you just go and claim it uh, with the previous link. Uh, and uh, the council members of Block and Wine community will confirm that you, you have done it. And after that one, you can submit down eating, right? Uh, you will see that uh, approval is pending. We will review it carefully. And uh, after that, you will be rewarded with one year back uh, to your account. So just uh, fun stuff over here uh, for everybody's engagement. So there are uh, different t uh, helpful resources for you guys that I want to share is, uh, first one is Zero to Hero with NFT series. I really love it because it goes from like no coding at all. You don't need to know anything but mouse clicking basically. Uh, and you will have your own NFT uh, contract program deployed to the blockchain and you can play with it and uh, try to understand. And then it goes uh, more in details about like what actually is happening and why you need to care about it. So definitely check it out if you want to understand like core piece and like what what is the tech behind NFTs. Uh, it's it's universal. It, it while it it has specifics of near. I think you will learn more about like NFTs um, in general. Uh, second best resource is more like uh, near oriented. You can go to near university and find the um, courses and. Uh, uh, valuable materials. Uh, all courses are free now, as far as I remember. Uh, so you can really go from uh, very very beginner level to, to to advanced one. Or if you already have experience, there are some courses for advanced level as well. So definitely check it out. And uh, just four days ago, there was a, a nice article about what is the blockchain. I really recommend uh, everybody to read through it. It, it's nothing, there is no like bullshit, what, how, how beautiful the space is. There are some pros and cons uh, in that article. There is no near uh, involved there, so they will mostly focus on like Bitcoin. 
uh, uh, tech, not the like application or like cryptocurrencies. And yeah, so you will also find some useful resources over here if you will uh, would, would like to um, join near community and, and, and stuff. Uh, yeah, I will share the the whole slide deck in the chat so you can uh, also find all the links and click them easily. Uh, yeah, that's uh, basically the whole presentation I wanted to bring to you today and uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to have any questions. Questions or is there anyone now already heading to pizza? No, thanks so much. Maybe you go back to the slide in order that everyone can see the um, pizza DAO uh, for our block and wine. Um, actually, it's the block and wine DAO then um, having a slice of pizza as a bounty, right? Uh, yeah. Exactly, that's cool. But I would have one question here because our, that's now a spoiler next week. We're going to have a talk about DAOs and the main question is what are the real world challenges to DAO and um, spoiler alert, it's going to be also with some legal involvement of course um, since the legal world also infringes with the real world but that's a different note. What are the DAOs involving now on NEO? What uh, do you see and is there a DAO movement or is there a tendency um, you can see what is happening, which kind of ecosystems, communities elaborate and grow, and they use the term DAO, where I would say, and this is my uh, assumption, a DAO is that what a single person understands it is, right? Um, like yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is quite a lot of usage actually in, in AstroDAO, so it's a web UI. Uh, you go astrodao.com, um, you can find a lot of DAOs over there. So they are usually used almost in every community we see right now in the ecosystem. So when that, if, if it's so we have many small local communities all around the globe, and they have some funding. And in order to actually uh, distribute that funding transparently and uh, with with ease uh, through UI, you can just use. Uh, interface and it will be there for you. Um, overall, I think there are many other applications of, of DAO these days which are still yet to be um, onboarded, I would say. Uh, like, even in this community, we could have had some uh, DAO to, uh, to maybe collect some uh, funding and, or make certain decisions as to where to do the next event. If we have enough funding, do we go there? We don't have enough funding, we go there. So it's, it's. I would say it's a cool tool and we should just uh, use it that way. It's, it, it's not gonna be like our primary daily driver here, but it's definitely worse for the communities and organizations, especially in, uh, in current um, world where like everything is moving towards remote and online work. Um, so I see a, a lot of uh, funds and, uh, and DAOs actually created on this platform now. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention is whenever you actually in, um, into a, um, how it's called, um, interacting with the uh, with DAO, it assumes that you are crypto native and you have your wallet and it's super easy to get on board with Nier and to prove that I actually have QR codes with me. So you, you can get, get to me and I will give you one QR code and you can just scan it. It's a private key uh, on each of them individual one and you will immediately guided through the process with some near tokens uh, available to you. Uh, so it, as you can see, it's a cup of coffee uh, QR code, so you can assume it's enough to actually buy a cup of coffee. <laughs> so, uh. Okay, cool. 
any any further questions so now then let's yeah um, you've got two bridges right now to ethereum is it right like rainbow and aurora yeah yeah i guess so um could you like uh, bridge nfts through this bridges yeah so the how, how the bridge actually works is uh, it uh, you you basically need to have some contract deployed on each of the networks so one is deployed on the ethereum uh, expects to receive certain uh, ft or nft tokens or some other type of assets and it locks and now like it's basically that it, so it's it's not happening on that account so as ft nft contracts work there is some third account which you communicate with it keeps a track of who is owner of this asset so the user needs to basically transfer the tokens uh, on that contract and so that ft nft contract would keep track and say okay the owner now is not this user but actually the bridge user so once the bridge user is the owner it uh, can actually mint an nft on the other side on on the on the other network uh, when it's proved that the the transaction happened and it's finalized blah 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 so long story short basically uh, it's a mechanism the bridge bridge is the mechanism that locks or basically transfers the ownership to some um, bridge contract bridge account on one network and then this the representation of that token is minted on another uh, network so does this answer your question yeah for, yeah for sure just in your documentation in your documentation is something standing with um, you can just bridge some uh, specific tokens, but if there, if it's possible with NFTs, I mean, t technology was there quite early. Maybe there is still no UI for that. I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, the, the, the usually the the hardest part is the user experience of uh, in in this uh, decentralized world, so, and and that's why I actually quite stoked on how um, Astro DAO does. Governance. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So then, Flat, we give you a big applause. Thanks so much. Thanks for setting up a DAO for us. And thanks yeah. for thanks the pizza. everybody. Okay. So, everyone, let's head to some wine and some pizza and enjoy the evening. Bye bye for now. <laughs>